understand the economy of Southeast Alaska, one must first understand its geography, as this is what anchors not just its culture and identity, but fundamentally its economy. Where pedestrians in the lower 48 cities walk among looming skyscrapers, Southeast Alaskans live beneath the towering peaks of the Coast Mountain Range. The Coast Range begins in the northern part of Southeast Alaska, at the southern end of the St. Elias Mountains, just north of Juneau, and stretches south, jutting upward along the sea coast of the entire Alaskan Panhandle. The Coast Mountains derives its name from its proximity to the coast, or perhaps I should say is actually the very coast itself, as Southeast Alaska's towns and boroughs sit atop the range's peaks. The islands that make up Southeast Alaska are actually the submerged sections of the coast range, and the tops of these submerged sections make up the group of islands that are called the Alexander Archipelago, and they consist of some 1,100 islands. And this is why the mountain range appears to explode out of the sea, above the islands that protrude above the ocean. Alaskans use the deep and narrow channels that meander among the islands, where many of the towns lie. Some of these passageways make up part of the Inside Passage, the route of the Alaska Marine Highway System. The Marine Highway System is the only roadway, other than flight, that provides the means for traveling between the towns in Southeast Alaska. Much of the islands that make up the Alexander Archipelago are remote and wild, and the vast majority are part of the Tongass National Forest. It is large enough, some 17 million acres, to preserve many endangered fauna and flora. The U.S.-Canadian border follows the crest of the boundary ranges of the Coast Mountains. And it is this coast range that produces the temperate rainforest, characteristic of Southeast Alaska. Clouds laden with ocean water encounter the cold, high mountain bulwark. They release their burden back into the arms of the archipelago, replenishing the western hemlock, Sitka spruce, dense stands of sphagnum moss and muskeg, and importantly, feeding our salmon streams. The entire Southeast Alaska is approximately 33,500 square miles of land and water. The islands of the archipelago only make up some 40% of this. The entire shoreline of Southeast is some 18,500 miles, where the 34 communities, villages, and towns reside, including Juneau, the state capital, Ketchikan, and Sitka who together make up 75% of the population and are considered the three largest communities. In 2016, the population of Southeast Alaska was around 74,000, where 45% lived in Juneau. Nearly a quarter of the population is indigenous Alaska natives, the Tlingit, Haida, and Simshian, who have lived in this sacred land and territory for some 11,000 years, and who developed a highly organized and culturally advanced culture, noted for their noble and dramatic totem poles, and who are skilled navigators. All three work the sea in ocean-going canoes, trading as sophisticated tradesmen. Only by understanding this unique intermingling of sea and mountains, forest and muskeg where the southeast towns survive on the rocky slopes of remote submerged mountain peaks, and whose only highway is the marine highway, can anyone appreciate and even understand the importance of the maritime sector to all the culture and people who live here now.
Maritime occupations are interwoven throughout the entire fabric of this culture and region. These people are intimately engaged with the sea and its inhabitants. But they must live mindful of the coast mountains above for its role in southeast weather. With the ocean-filled clouds above, the mountains act as a barrier, forcing the release of the burdened weight, feeding the water back into the temperate rainforests, muskegs, and salmon streams, dropping in some burrows over 13 feet per year. But on a summer sunny day in southeast Alaska, the sun comes a hollering overhead, and the blues of the incessant rains take on new meaning. The blues and greens awaken in a stunning display, and if you should visit southeast, these are the colors that you will remember. The greens of our temperate rainforests, and the blues of the canals, channels, and open ocean, dotted with fishing boats, tugboats, freighters, and of course, summer cruise ships. As one would expect within such a geography, with no roads between the islands of the Alexander Archipelago, Southeast Alaskans have, by far, more home-ported vessels than any other region in the state of Alaska. Only one of many ways that the maritime culture is intimately interwoven into the Southeast Alaskan soul. According to the report, Trends and Opportunities in the Alaska Maritime Industrial Support Sector, of the 9,400 vessels greater than 28 feet in Alaskan waters in 2014, 81% were home ported in the state of Alaska. But of that 81%, more than 42% were home ported in Southeast Alaska. Cook Inlet was the next largest region, with only 21%, followed by Prince William Sound, who only contributed 13%. But measuring the magnitude and significance of the maritime sector on Southeast Alaska's overall economy is not a simple task. The reason is that there is no maritime sector in the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis or at the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, who both rely on the North American Industry Classification System, NAICS, the standard used by federal statistical agencies in classifying business establishments for the purpose of collecting, analyzing, and publishing statistical data related to the United States business economy. These codes are used to aggregate employment, earnings, and business categories, but these categories do not include a maritime category or sector. For example, NAICS Codes 31 to 33 covers the manufacturing sector, but this sector also includes food manufacturing, apparel manufacturing, chemical manufacturing, aerospace products and parts manufacturing. Buried in all these categories, you will find ship and boat building. When all maritime employment or mixed maritime employment is buried within the 12 standard categories, this is what it looks like. This report would not inform the reader of the role or importance of the maritime sector for the state of Alaska, or for the regions for which this category is a main economic driver. In fact, one might be led to believe that the only element to the maritime sector is the seafood sector, which, according to this table, comes in third in total earnings and fourth in total employment. The seafood sector includes commercial fishing, seafood processing, and commercial fisheries management. And even here, the maritime sector has not been adequately accounted for. Maritime categories that are spread among these larger categories include ship, boat building, and repair are buried within construction. Other items include pile driving or breakwater and dock repair. Marinas and boat dealers or even mixed marine recreation like sports fishing, kayaking, and even sporting goods stores are buried within retail or even all other. All of these maritime activities are buried within the ostensibly non-maritime sectors. When you subtract the maritime activities from the other sectors, 
like trade or construction sectors, and then add them to the new maritime sector, this new sector begins to float to the top of Southeast Alaska's employment reports, while others are adjusted downward. Nearly every business and employment earnings in Southeast Alaska are directly or indirectly related to a maritime sector, even though such a sector is not defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, or even at the State of Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development. Yet, just stand in our harbors and watch what we do, what we wear, and pass the various boat harbors as you walk the streets in our towns. Our visitors arrive on cruise ships or ferries. Our food is delivered by barges. Freight ships move our timber, mine the metals, and ship them to market. Even many of our government jobs are related to maritime, as they regulate the fishing industry, manage coastal and harbor areas, operate docks and research habitat. Even our so-called construction jobs may involve maritime support activities. For example, breakwater and seawall work dock repair, pile driving, boat lift installation, work typically accomplished by construction firms, but working in maritime tasks. In 2012, the Southeast Conference decided that this sector was not receiving the attention it needed to ensure the preservation, support, and growth of the economy in our region. The Southeast Conference is an organization in Southeast Alaska that advocates for issues that are key to the Southeast region as a whole. Their goal is to help develop strong economies, healthy communities, and a quality environment in Southeast Alaska. They funded an in-depth analysis on the top economic drivers in Southeast Alaska and asked the researchers to identify what makes Southeast Alaska unique. This required researchers to return to the detailed maritime data across all sectors in the NAICS data, and then re-aggregate the categories into a new sector, the maritime sector. The results were not too surprising to anyone living in Southeast Alaska. In 2012, this category alone contributed 26%, or over a quarter of the employment-related income to our economy and 21% of all jobs in Southeast Alaska. The 2017 report found that in 2016, 6,386 jobs were employed in maritime, and they received $354 million in wages. When compared to the other sectors, without even subtracting the maritime activity from the other sectors, it is clear that in Southeast Alaska, maritime total earnings come in second, only below government jobs, and replaces tourism or the visitor sector in total earnings. Interestingly, it does not replace tourism by total job numbers. It replaces tourism only in wages. This is due to the fact that tourism tends to provide lower wages than found in the maritime sector, even though they may hire more employees. Even more surprising, however, were the location quotients within this new sector. Now, a location quotient provides a measure that indicates how concentrated an industry or occupation is within a region when compared to the nation as a whole. And it helps to identify what makes a given region unique. Any industry with a quotient greater than one is considered a concentrated industry unique to a region. Our maritime categories were off the charts. The private maritime sector, or non-government jobs, were found to be 49 times more prevalent than in the U.S. as a whole, and commercial fishing was 95 times more prevalent. And our region's maritime businesses were 35 times more concentrated or specialized in Southeast Alaska. Quoting the Southeast Conference Executive Director in 2012, Shelley Wright, We are a maritime economy. It is what most marks our identity and what fuels our economic engine. Our maritime economy permeates into every aspect of our economy and includes tourism jobs and fishing jobs, government jobs and natural resource development. 
Maritime sector jobs are referred to as blue jobs, as they are related to the ocean, and they are broken into a private and public sector. The private sector was by far the greater contributor, making up 75% of the total public and private maritime sector earnings. The private sector employee earnings in Southeast Alaska accounted for 30% of all Southeast Alaska private sector employment income and includes jobs like commercial fishermen and those employed by seafood plants, barge and marine freight services, whale watching and other ocean-based excursions, charter fishing, marinas, boat dealers and ship and boat building, and repair craftsmen. But it also includes jobs that mix maritime and non-maritime earnings. For example, again, breakwater and seawall work, dock repair, pile driving, boat lift installation, and all work done by construction firms working in maritime tasks. But a large portion of the private maritime sector is composed of the Maritime Industrial Sector, or MIS. The maritime industrial sector in Alaska includes businesses and organizations of some 800 firms that offer services or supplies to vessel owners and operators. The largest concentration of these types of businesses in the MIS sector is in southeast Alaska, with the next largest in Cook Inlet and then Kodiak. The McDowell Group identified 21 Alaskan communities that have an established MIS sector. This means that these 21 communities are able to remove vessels from the water and provide repair and maintenance work. Vigor Industrial is the leading provider of shipbuilding, ship repair, and complex fabrication in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, and who build and repair fishing boats, fireboats, tugs, barges, ferries, and other ships, and maintains the largest dry dock facilities in Southeast Alaska. Vicker was responsible for 180 direct jobs at 10.9 million in direct wages in 2016. In addition, Vigor Industrial spends 5 million annually on Ketchikan goods and services. Moreover, Vigor was responsible for 90 indirect jobs at $3.3 million in indirect wages in 2015. This shipyard has recently built the largest commercial fishing vessel built in Alaska, has built both Ketchikan Airport ferries, and is scheduled to deliver two new ferries for the Alaska Marine Highway System, the Taslina and the Hubbard. The Department of Commerce, Community and Economic Development provides an interactive map of the maritime infrastructure and industrial support services available in the state. The infrastructure shown here indicates that there are a total of 21 communities that provide such infrastructure for vessels. There are about 100 businesses in Alaska that have some involvement in vessel building and repair. But the majority of the boat builders in Alaska focus on vessels that are less than some 40 feet. Only a few communities have a significant infrastructure to support large vessel building, vessel maintenance and repair. Fifteen communities provide a total of 25 travel lifts, devices that can lift and move vessels for boat maintenance and repair. Kodiak has the largest capacity that is able to lift vessels that are up to 180 feet long and 42 feet wide and 660 tons. Seward and then Huna follows. Huna in southeast Alaska has the ability to lift 220 tons. Alaska also has five dry docks. Dry docks typically allow vessels to be floated in and then drained to allow the boat to come to rest on a dry platform and then are used for construction, maintenance, and repair of ships. There are five dry docks in Alaska, two in Southeast, Ketchikan and Sitka. The largest, with a capacity of 10,000 tons, is located in Ketchikan. Sitka hosts the smallest at 850 tons, which was built and is operated by Allen Marine. We now turn to the communities who provide maritime industrial services, and this varies significantly. 
We can view the services in both Kodiak and Seward. In southeast Alaska, we have Ketchikan, Sitka, and Wrangell. These are the towns who have the best developed MIS services in the state. These communities also have relatively comprehensive MIS coverage, including the ability to lift larger vessels from the water for boatyard work. All of our maritime communities in Alaska rely heavily on the maritime industry for maintaining vessels that support the transportation of our community's goods and maintain their commercial fishing fleets, encourage tourism, and supports the marine highway system fleets as well. Of concern to many vessel owners and operators, vessels in the Alaskan fleet are aging, and it is estimated that by 2025, the Alaska fleet will include roughly 3,100 vessels between 28 feet and 59 feet that are more than 45 years old. These older vessels span the entire fleet to passenger vessels, four of them state ferries, but also include tugs and barges, all that are over 50 years old. Many of them are commercial fishing vessels. Most vessels operating in Alaska were built between 1970 and 1989. But the fleet contains more than 500 vessels built before 1950 and 1,300 built before 1970. Replacement for these vessels could provide and encourage economic growth for all of our MIS sectors in Southeast Alaska. However, we will need to be proactive to ensure that these ships and vessels are built in Alaska, providing the needed jobs and growth to our towns and boroughs. This will require us to be ready with the necessary infrastructure and trained personnel with the requisite expertise and skills to step up to the important opportunity for all Alaskans. The alternative is that these vessels are replaced in MIS centers down south, in Seattle, and other maritime centers. If we are committed to growing our economies and providing important opportunities for jobs to our communities, we will need to be ready to support the industrial sector and support the training and education centers that ensures the industrial sector will be supplied with Alaskan expertise. According to the McDowell Group report, Trends and Opportunities in the Alaska Maritime Industrial Support Sector, our MIS centers have been driven historically by our proximity to commercial fishing grounds. The MI services have grown to address the demand for maintenance and repair needs for the local fishing fleets. But they have also grown importantly with the support of public-private partnerships. For example, between the University of Alaska Southeast's Maritime Center and Vigor Industrial in Ketchikan, and like the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, whose acronym is ADA. ADA owns the Ketchikan Shipyard and supported the necessary infrastructure development for the Vigor Shipyard. These types of partnerships have spurred significant economic activity and growth for our communities. According to the ADA website, and I quote, ADA is a public corporation of the state of Alaska, created in 1967 by the Alaska Legislature, in the interest of promoting the health, security, and general welfare of all the people of the state, and a public purpose to increase job opportunities and otherwise to encourage the economic growth of the state. Unquote. The Ketchikan Shipyard's public-private partnership not only includes ADA, but the partnership also includes the borough and city of Ketchikan, which has financial MOUs, or Memorandum of Understandings, with Vigor Industrial. Vigor purchased Alaska Ship and Dry Dock in March of 2012. In 2004, the Alaska governor moved the headquarters of the Alaska Marine Highway System from Juneau to Ketchikan, so that state ferry engineers and managers could benefit by being in the same community as the growing shipyard. All of these improvements have allowed the vigorous shipyard in Ketchikan to grow and prosper and has further increased its capacity and competitiveness, better positioning Southeast Alaska to pursue the business of complex, high volume ship repair and building projects. 
But we will now turn to the largest public or government maritime sector and take a close look at the economic benefits of our Alaskan marine highway system. There are other ferries that operate in our island that are not managed by the Alaska Marine Highway System, like the Inter-Island Ferry Authority, but we will focus our attention on the state-supported Alaska Marine Highway System. turn to the largest public or government maritime sector and take a close look at the economic benefits of our Alaskan marine highway system. The largest contributor by far to the maritime public sector is Alaska's marine highway system, the primary highway for all in southeast Alaska. The routes that traverse the channels, the canals, and open ocean are often remote and wild. Its southernmost port is in Bellingham, Washington, and continues for more than 3,500 miles to Dutch Harbor in the Aleutian Islands, with over 35 stops along the way. In 2014, the Alaska Marine Highway System fleet included 11 vessels, seven operating in the southeast system and four in the southwest. In 2014, passenger and vehicle traffic included 319,000 passengers and over 108,000 vehicles. There were 7,000 port departures in 2014, and the Southeast Alaska system represented 75% of that traffic, 76% of the passengers, and 72% of both vehicles and port departures. Ferries transport not just people and vehicles, but freight and goods and services to the communities throughout Alaska. But measuring the impact of the ferry system on Southeast Alaska's economic well-being is comparable to measuring the impact of the network of freeways and highways on the economic well-being and growth to the lower 48. And this means that the ferry service in Southeast Alaska is fundamentally part of our infrastructure. There are significant benefits of supplying ferry service to all Alaskans, just as the roadway network have many benefits for the states in the lower 48. And these positive benefits accrue to Alaskans as a whole. In Alaska, such an infrastructure encourages tourism, which increases income to Alaskans. It decreases the cost in transportation when moving goods to and from markets, creating more competitive businesses, thereby encouraging economic growth. And it provides for a more mobile labor force who is able to move freely and at a lower cost among the islands. Infrastructure development is the fuel for the engine of economic growth. The infrastructure provided by the Alaska Marine Highway System supports and increases economic growth and as such increases tax revenue, enhances labor markets and new jobs but it also provides connectivity and social cohesion among and across communities. An improved transportation network improves livelihoods by providing important services, like health care, on neighboring islands. Here are just a few of the ways that Southeast Alaskans actually benefit from the Alaska Marine Highway System. They carry tourists and visitors to the state who spend millions on hotels, dining, and recreation, creating jobs and income for Alaskans. They provide transportation for residents to purchase goods and services, including health care and other necessities that are not provided by their own local stores and communities. They provide a means for fishermen to move seafood to market and act as a transport for building materials and machinery to villages and towns. They carry cargo worth millions of dollars and more than 100,000 vehicles annually. 
And equally important, they act as a means that connect communities for social and cultural enhancement. Like high school basketball games, cultural gatherings, college fairs, celebrations, festivals and funerals, encouraging social cohesion within and among our communities. The Alaska Marine Highway System is our roadway that without it, most islands in the Alexander Archipelago would remain isolated and without critical services. Without the Alaska Marine Highway System or the Inter-Island Ferry Authority, it would be cost prohibitive to move people around or obtain needed goods and services required for economic growth and for many just plain sustenance. However, Alaska's marine highway system cannot be considered a profit-generating business when viewed as a private business. The Alaska Marine Highway System has required continued ongoing state fiscal support. That included the state's general fund investment of $117 million in 2014. The ferry system operates in the red financially. But it is also critical to understand its total social benefits to Alaskans as a whole. Consider the economic impacts of the Alaska Marine Highway System that ripple throughout the Southeast as well as throughout our state. According to a 2014 study, the economic impacts of the Alaska Marine Highway System, they found that for every dollar spent on the Alaska Marine Highway System yielded an economic return of over $2. This amounts to a two-to-one investment for the state. Though the Alaska Marine Highway System operates in the red, it does not operate in the red when viewed as a social good. The total social benefits far exceed its social costs. And a large number of the ferry passengers support the growing industry of tourism. That number has been growing and in 2016, in spite of the many maritime sectors jobs that did decline, including a very bad year in 2016 for the seafood sector, the worst year in over a decade, tourism itself grew. In fact, tourism is booming. 2017 experienced record numbers for cruise ships and reflected increased opportunities for many jobs and improved spending in all of Southeast Alaska. The tourism and visitor sector, with the support of our ferries, acted as a life preserver for our economy in 2017. Here are just a few of the benefits documented in the McDowell Group report. The Alaska Marine Highway employees reside in 44 different Alaska communities. Ketchikan resident employees were the largest at 318, followed closely by Juneau residents at 297. Both Ketchikan and Juneau accounted for 60% of the employees working for the Alaska Marine Highway System. A hundred million in wages and benefits were paid to Alaskans in 2014. Ketchikan resident employees received the largest amount, followed closely by Juneau residents. The Alaska Marine Highway System spent in operation spending about $46 million with Alaska businesses. 65% was spent in Southeast. Juno received the largest at $29 million, followed by Cordova, Anchorage, and Ketchikan each, which received $4 million. But it does not stop there. 94% of all capital spending by the Alaska Marine Highway System was spent in Southeast Alaska. Ketchikan alone represented 81% of Alaska Highway Marine System capital expenditures from shipbuilding and repair facilities at Vigor. South Central accounted for only 4%, and all of the regions accounted for 2%. Clearly, Southeast Alaska, when compared to Southwest and South Central Alaska, was by far more heavily engaged, not just as customers of the Alaska Marine Highway System, but as wage earners as well. This helps to explain why the marine highway system is not just a vital part of Alaska's transportation infrastructure, it also makes clear that the returns to Alaskans far outweigh the current costs that even include continued ongoing state fiscal support. But perhaps it is best to hear it from Southeast Alaskans themselves. 
Here are just a few of the personal stories of how we in the Southeast benefit from the ferries and why it is so important to our way of life. As provided by the Southeast Conference and produced by the Rain Coast Data, here it is from Alaskans themselves. Drew and Smith Transport in Pelican. It's vital to be able to get supplies and products in and out. Pelican has no grocery store or hardware store. We pick up their orders from Juno, process them, and bring them out on the ferry. We get out there and the whole town shows up. In Southeast, the ferry is a necessity. It's a way of life. Our football season starts mid-August and we are moving kids all the way through May. If there's a ferry that goes, that's how we go. There is no funding at all in our district for the students to travel. They have to fundraise everything. If we can't take the ferry, it knocks down the number of kids who can travel. The more we can use the ferry, the more kids get to participate. Kathy Messing, Activities Assistant, Thunder Mountain High School in Juneau. And here's from Kenneth, the Hunan Mayor. From an Alaskan Native cultural side, we have events that require gatherings of clans and family persons. The ferry allows for transportation to get all of those people together, and it is our method to go and visit extended family members, and vice versa. Huna is a rural community, and we see Juno and Sitka as hubs. We use the ferry to connect with our state and federal government, to access medical care, and access the commercial sector the shops and services that are not available in Huna. Here is Gavin Hudson, Tribal Council member in Metlakatla. The Latuya Ferry is our direct line to Ketchikan in any weather. It gives us access to the hospital. It can be life and death in terms of medical travel. A box of Cheerios here costs $9. To make their dollars stretch further, a lot of people go grocery shopping in Ketchikan because the prices are a lot better there. The Latuya plays a huge economic role between Ketchikan and Metlakatla. Ketchikan's economy is infused with dollars from Metlakatla, and Metlakatlans enjoy the savings they get in Ketchikan. The Alaska Marine Highway is our highway. It's our trade route. We had a huge blizzard and my two-year-old son was diagnosed with a very bad case of appendicitis. The doctor called the Coast Guard, but the Coast Guard couldn't fly. The ferry turned around and redocked in Haines. I don't know what would have happened without the ferry. The ferry is such a vital link for medical reasons. As Alaskans, we accept some risk. But the development of the Alaska Marine Highway is one way we've mitigated those risks. And it works. Stephanie Scott, former Haines Mayor. These stories help to explain the importance of our marine highway system to Southeast Alaskans. It is not just a transportation link. It is our lifeblood that flows among our islands, that funds and sustains us as Alaskans and helps build a cohesive Alaska by fundamentally connecting Alaska to Alaskans and to the rest of the world. It is our roadway and a more powerful connector than social media or smartphones in connecting our communities and in providing income and necessities that sustain us and support our unique way of life within our maritime economy. The marine highway system is an important aspect and powerfully demonstrates our unique relationship and our dependence on the sea, not just for our livelihood, but as a means for social and cultural interaction and communication with our neighbors, building our own unique roads that bonds us as a community and anchors us to the maritime economy.